Hello everyone this is part 1 of what if Naruto was banished and becomes Master Swordsman, and this story is made by Nice456, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, to see more comment down below, now let's start the intro. Naruto's POV Kanoa, the village hidden in the leaves, one of the strongest villages of the five shinobi villages. It has been my home for 12 long years. To others, 12 years may not be a long time, however, only a few people have shouldered the burden that I had to shoulder throughout my life. I, Uzumaki Naruto, was chosen to carry the QB that attacked the village 12 years prior. I often wonder why I was chosen out of so many kids. Was there no other child that the Yondime could have placed this curse on? Why me? This is probably the only question that I want answered. It seems that we tend not to get what we want. A couple of months back, the only question that I wanted an answer to was, why was I hated by the adult so much? After Mizuki had informed me that I was the jailer of the strongest of the Yukai, it all became clear. The stares, the remarks, were all because of what they thought I was. It seems that the kids in my age group followed their parents' lead by treating me like I was nothing. The pranks, the loud, and brash attitude that I displayed was a cry for attention. All I ever wanted was for people to acknowledge my existence. I think that's why old man Sandime never punished me for my many transgressions, he was the only one who knew why I committed those pranks. Being alone is hell, a hell that I do not wish upon anyone. I used to sit on the swing and watch the other kids with their parents and it would pain me. I wish that I could experience what they had at least once in my life. Well, I guess you could say that Aruka sensei is like the father I never had. He gives advice and he treats me like I'm somebody. He was even willing to sacrifice his life to save mine. That's the sort of thing a loving father would do. The closest thing that I had to a mother is a 50-year-old who doesn't look a day over 30. Tsunidaba Chan cares for me deeply. When we first met, I wanted to punch her lights out for disrespecting the old man's sacrifice by saying the position of Hokage was shit. We fought but she was clearly my better. She seemed as though she could care less about what happened to anyone. However, Jiraiya, told me when we got to the village how she had protected me from Orokimaru. He told me that she had taken a sword to the heart. He also informed me that she told Orokimaru that I was going to be Hokage someday. She believed in me enough to protect me from harm. That is something that a mother would do. I'm glad that there are at least two people that care for me. I thought that Team 7 would become the family that always I wanted. That, however, was not meant to be. Kakashi-sensei, who wasn't really a sensei, well not to me at least, never showed any interest in me. When I won against Kiba in the tournament, he didn't even congratulate me on my victory. I guess that was reserved for his favorite student. I asked him to train me but he made up an excuse about how bad my chakra control was. That was the whole reason I asked him to help me, but whatever. I guess training Sasuke was a higher priority. Sakura is no different. It is always Sasuke this and Sasuke that. Even when I saved her from Gara, she had assumed it was Sasuke. He told her that it was me, but did I get a thank you? Nope, I got nothing. The event that showed that I would never have her was when I dragged Sunid to heal Sasuke. I saw her at his bedside, to me it looked like she hadn't left since he was placed there. When Abar Chan healed him and he woke up, she hugged him as if he was the most precious thing ever. It pained me to see that Sasuke had beat me again, this time he did it without even trying. I never understood Sasuke. Here is a guy who is loved by all throughout the village, yet he chooses to be lonely. He was born with the most feared bloodline limit, he is extremely gifted, and has every girl in the village after him. He also had Kakashi train him personally. He had everything and he threw it all away for vengeance. He even shoved a Chidori into my chest. I always saw him as a friend, a rival, a brother. Now all I see is a guy who took the easy way out to obtain power. I promised Sakura that I would bring him back, but I failed to do so. I really did try for her sake. During those four days that I spent recovering in the hospital, I had expected Sakura to visit but she never did. I will never forget the day that I was released. I would be forever changed by it. Flashback. The village's stairs were even colder than before. I even heard some comments that suggested that I was responsible for Sasuke's betrayal of the Kanoa. 
I ignored it and continued home. I was glad to see Sakura about a block ahead of me. She was with that crazy blonde girl Eno. I ran up to them to greet them. As I called out her name she didn't even acknowledge me. When I stopped her she had a look in her eyes that indicated that she was mad at me. I just smiled. Hey, Sakura-chan. She responded, what do you want, Naruto? I looked down because of the guilt of not fulfilling my promise. Sakura-chan, I'm sorry that I couldn't bring Sasuke back. Her response was something that I had not expected. Sorry. Sorry that you couldn't keep your promise. No Naruto, I'm sorry for believing that a dead last like you would bring back Sasuke-kun. Sakura-chan, I really tried but. Tried. Yeah right, you didn't try. Why would you try to save Sasuke? You knew I liked him and I bet you thought that if he was out of the picture then I would say yes to a date. Sakura-chan that's not true. I really tried to bring him bar. Enough Naruto. Get this through your head, I have never liked you and never will. Ino spoke in a defending tone, Sakura, I understand that you have feelings for Sasuke but that's going too far. Not even Naruto deserves that. Sakura glared at Ino. Ino, this has nothing to do with you so mind your own business. Ino glared at the pink-haired Kunoiki. Naruto spoke once more, Sakura-chan, no matter what I did or said, Sasuke didn't want to come back. But don't worry, I will bring him back for you. Save your promises for someone else. The only thing that I want you to do for me is to never speak to me again. I wish that it was you who left and not Sasuke. Sakura ran off. Naruto stood there feeling as though someone had told him his dog died. He felt pain in his heart. The girl he would have done anything for to protect had broken his heart. Ino looked at Sakura, who was running off into the distance, then back at Naruto. She even felt sorry for what had happened. He looked really hurt by Sakura's words, she thought. Ino spoke, you know Naruto, I think she's just upset. No she doesn't deserve any excuses, Ino. I thought she was my friend, I guess I was wrong. I have to go home. I guess I'll see you later, bye. End of flashback. I thought that it couldn't get any worse than that but I would be proven wrong once again. A week later I was called before the council. The council had declared that it was my fault for the injuries that my comrades had sustained. I was also blamed for not returning Sasuke back to the village. I tried to plea my case but it fell on deaf ears. The worst I thought was going to happen was a six-month suspension of my ninja license, but they did something that I'd never expect. I was banished from Kanoa. My dream of being Hokage died that day. Jiraiya tried to plead that I had helped fend off Gara during the Sound Sand invasion, but it fell on deaf ears once again. Abar-chan didn't have the power to go against the council and was unable to save me from this fate. The day that I was scheduled to leave, I went to Abar-chan's office. Since I wasn't going to be the Hokage, I felt that there was no reason to keep the necklace. I gave it back to her and left. I had also asked her to give Aruka back the headband he had given me. Jiraiya had offered to train me for the next three years, but I told him that he didn't need to. He insisted but I declined and told him not to worry and that I would be okay. He respected my decision, but he decided to give me some scrolls with some techniques. He told me that he was leaving the village and wasn't stepping foot into it again. Erosenon told me where to find him whenever I wanted to learn some S-class jutsus. I left two days after that meeting. I could see the villagers look at me with smirks on their faces. It was fine, I was giving them what they had wanted for so long, my departure. Kanoa was no longer my home. It was time for me to find a new home. I made a vow that I would become the greatest ninja ever. It's been six years since I was banished. During that time I met and trained with ninjas from other villages as well as samurais. When I left, I headed to Wave Country to see Tazuna and his family. I only stayed three months before I went to Water Country. I ran into a missing nin by the name of Seiki Kaito. He was one of the seven swordsmen of the mist. I followed him around for the next two years, learning all that I could from him. During this time we did missions together and became like brothers. After two years passed, I had decided it was time to part ways. I was still on a quest for strength so I needed to continue on my path. My departure from Kaito-sensei led me to see country, where I met a samurai clan known as the Manashu clan. I had thought I had already learned all I needed about Kenjutsu but I was wrong. The samurai took me in and trained me under the heavenly sword. 
Since I knew how to wield a sword, it only took me a year to master the style. By the time I had finished mastering the style, I considered myself one of the top 10 ninjas in the world. I know that sounds cocky but I believed it to be true. The next year was spent with Jiraiya, perfecting my Tajutsu and Ninjutsu and taking on missions after a year of training with the Manashu. I also learned some Genjutsu from the scrolls, and from Jiraiya as well. My skills had improved greatly during that time. No longer was I the dead last or the idiot. I am known throughout the ninja world as the Golden Fox. I guess I got that name due to my yellow hair and whisker marks. During this time, Kanoa had defeated the Sound Village, killing Orokimaru in the process. The Akatuski was dealt with a couple of months later. I like to say I had a big part in that. After all, I did kill three members. I softened them up for Kanoa and Suna. Sasuke finally got his revenge and killed his brother. I heard that the village accepted him back after his betrayal. My sources have informed me that all he got was a year of probation. He is now currently a Junin and an Anbu squad captain. Two years after the fall of the Sound and Akatsuki, Cloud declared war on the Leaf for unknown reasons. The war doesn't concern me. I live in Sun Country now with my fiancé and her mother. I met Yumi when I was 17. I remember the day we met. I saved her from some thugs who tried to rob her and possibly force themselves on her. When I looked at her, I was mesmerized by her long brown hair, her green eyes and her shapely body. After I saved her life, she insisted that I have dinner with her and her mother so I did. Her mother, Mai, who looked like an older version of Yumi, accepted me with open arms. From that day Yumi and I were always together. Peaceful as things were, I knew it wouldn't last for long. It never does. Outside of the greenhouse made of wood, with a farm in the back, sitting in a chair on the porch, with Yumi cuddled up to me, I noticed the presence of five people. Judging by the way they moved it had to be ninja. I didn't alert Yumi to their presence, I didn't want her to get scared. Within a matter of seconds, five shurikens flew at me and Yumi. I used the kawarimi no jutsu. I was behind the ninja holding a kunai at the throat, but I found that I couldn't move. It was the cage main. There was only one person I knew who could do this technique. End of Naruto's POV. Shikamaru, you can let me go now. I wasn't going to hurt your friend here. Also tell Shino, Neji, and Tenten that they can come out now. Soon enough, Neji, Shino, Tenten and Shikamaru came into view. They lifted up their mask so I could see their faces. Shikamaru released the cage main. I decided to speak to the ninja I was behind, you can remove your mask as well, Ino. She complied. Yumi and her mother came from the house to see if I was okay. Shikamaru spoke, Sunitsama had asked us to track you down. I told her how troublesome it would be but she had insisted that we find you. Neji stepped forth to speak, Naruto, Sunitsama has requested that you return back with us to Kanoa. I looked at Neji and laughed, she requested that I come back. Tell her I am no longer a shinobi of the leaf and I am not obligated to do as she says. Ino decided to speak, Naruto, she asked us to bring you back. Please come back with us. Tell me, Ino, what could she want from me? She didn't want anything the past six years, why now all of a sudden? Shino spoke in his usual tone, Uzumaki Naruto, God I'm Sama wishes for you to assist us in this war with the cloud. I walked past the ninjas from Kanoa and headed to the doorway towards my fiancé who was looking worried. I stopped and spoke, instead of trying to get me to fight Kanoa's battles, you should be preparing for attacks from Cloud Nin. Tell Abar chan that I said good luck defeating the Cloud. Naruto, how could you turn your back on your home? It's your duty to protect the Kanoa. Tenten said desperately. It's not my home, it never was. That place was hell to me. I was hated by every villager in that village. I was also banished by the council. So tell me, Tenten, would you consider a place that exiled you a home? There was complete silence. I thought so. Tell Abar Chan that the only way I will fight for Kanoa is if she's willing to pay for my services. My going rate isn't cheap though. Tell her I want 70 million yo for my services and an additional 20 million bonus. Take that offer to her and come back to let me know her decision. That's an outrageous figure, Naruto. Ino stated. Well, I told you I don't come cheap. I'm sure the cloud will have no problem paying the bill. Shikamaru sighed. If that's all you request, then pack your things Naruto. We want to get back to Kanoa ASAP. 
Ino spoke, Shikamaru, you can't be serious. That is too much money for. Neji interrupted, well, Sunitsama did say no matter what it took. Do you actually think that's what she meant, Neji? Asked Tenten incredulously. Our mission states that we bring Uzumaki Naruto back with us to Kanoa. After that, it is no longer our responsibility. Shino stated. Shikamaru looked at Naruto, so are you coming or what? Naruto fixed his gaze on Shikamaru, on one more condition. What is it now that you demand? Ino spat out. Naruto turned to the door, where his fiancée and his mother-in-law to be were standing. They come with me. When word gets out that I'm fighting on Kanoa's side, the cloud will send nins to use them as bait against me. At least in the leaf, I know that they will be safe. Shikamaru thought to himself, what a troublesome guy. After closing his eyes, then reopening them, he spoke, fine. As long as you're coming I could care less about who you bring with you. Naruto gave the group a large grin, then it's settled. We depart in two hours. He walked towards Yumi. She had a sad look in her eyes. Truth be told, Yumi didn't want Naruto to be a ninja anymore for fear of losing him. Even so, she knew he was a ninja through and through and she respected it. He placed his hand gently on her face pulling it up so his eyes could meet hers. Don't worry. Nothing will happen to me, that I can promise. Come on, we have to pack our stuff so we can get out of here. With that said, they broke free from each other's embrace and headed into the house. Yumi's mother invited the other ninjas into the house. After two hours had passed, everyone was now ready to head out. Naruto was dressed in a black, short-sleeved shirt with black sweatpants to match. He wore bandages around his shin the way Kakashi did. He also had on black ninja sandals. His sword was placed on his back. The sword was eloquent. One couldn't see the blade, but judging by the black and gold handle, and the black case with a golden fox carved on it, it was safe to say that the sword could cut through almost anything. He got the sword from Manashu Raiho, the head of the samurai clan who had taught him personally. Yumi was wearing a brown long-sleeved shirt and beige pants. Her sandals matched the color of her shirt. Mai had on a long blue long-sleeved shirt, black pants, and black sandals much like Naruto's. Naruto put Yumi on his back, while Neji carried Yumi's mother. The other three carried the small book bags that the three residents of Sun Country had packed. In a matter of seconds, they took to the trees. It would take an hour to reach the docks, where a ship was waiting to escort them to Kanoa, where it would take about two hours to arrive there. Three hours later in Kanoa. In the Hockage Tower, behind the desk of the Hockage office sat a 56-year-old blonde woman, who could pass for 20, doing paperwork. With a war going on and missions to complete, she was exhausted. She was trying to find ways to end this war. She tried presenting a treaty to Rakage, but the young prick didn't want a treaty. For the last eight months the war went on with no side gaining an upper ground. She honestly didn't know what the war was for, but she believed that the young Rakage just wanted to prove his country was stronger than the leaf. She felt that there were better ways to go about doing this but it was his village after all. She ran hers and that was all that mattered. Sitting with her right arm holding up her head, Sunid looked at the door when her assistant came in. Sunid Sama, Shikamaru's team has returned with Naruto. They're in the waiting room, Shizun stated. Shizun, send them in. Shikamaru and the rest of his team entered with Naruto and two people she didn't recognize. When she saw Naruto, she was trying to hold back her tears. She kept them from falling and she began to speak. Naruto, I'm glad that you could make it. I thought that you were going to turn down my request, she said, with happiness in her voice. I did turn down your request. The only reason I'm here is because you're paying for my services, he responded. One of her eyebrows slightly elevated, paying for your services. So you're not doing this to help the leaf? She questioned. Naruto gave her a smirk. Sunid, do you really think that I would fight for this village after what they did to me? No, I'm not here to protect your village, I'm here because of the 90 million yo I'm being paid for my services. She felt a pain in her heart when he said her name instead of a bar chan. She knew then that their relationship had changed. She blamed herself for that. She got mad at the fact that he was fighting only for money. She responded in angry tone, so, you only fight for money now. Whatever happened to the kid that fought to protect his precious people? Did you forget about that or what? He smiled at her then placed his arms around Yumi. I do fight for my precious people. 
that never has and never will change. However, there is no one here in Kanoa that is precious to me, so there is no reason whatsoever to fight for anyone here. If you're not willing to pay for my services, then I will leave and return to my life. So what's it going to be? Sunid sighed. Very well then, before we can pay for your services, you must be brought before the council so they can approve of it. Neji, would you escort Naruto's guest to the hotel? Naruto, follow me. Naruto kissed his girl, I'll see you as soon as I'm done okay. Yumi nodded her head in agreement. Exiting the office, Mai and Yumi followed behind Neji while Naruto and Sunid headed to the council room. Sunid started a conversation with the man who was an inch or two shorter than Jiraiya. So, tell me Naruto, who were those two back there? My fiancé and her mother. Judging by the tone in his voice she could clearly see that he didn't really want to talk. She still decided to get some answers about the girl and what he did during the last six years. She knew he was strong. Just mentioning his name in the rock, rain, mist, and grass caused panic. The man who stood walking next to her was arguably the most feared ninja in the world. She spoke once more. Um, Naruto, how did you guys meet? Naruto, who never even looked at her, I'm touched that you want to know about my life, but I really don't feel the need to tell you. She hadn't expected Naruto to be this cold. She knew that there was a chance that he would despise her in this village for what transpired six years ago, but she was hoping he didn't. Deep inside, she was hoping that he would be happy to return but she knew that it would only be in her fantasy. After a minute of walking, they finally reached the council room in the Hockage Tower. Inside the big room was a long square table that sat 14. The room was like a cave in the sense that the light only illuminated it enough for one to see everything in their surroundings. On the walls were pictures, Naruto recognized that some were the Hokages of the past. Tsunid motioned for him to sit. She walked to the other end of the room and took her seat, which faced Naruto's. There were 12 other members seated. The order was as followed. On Naruto's left, Yamanaka Inaki was seated at the first seat, Nara Shikaku was seated at the second seat, Akamaiki Chuzu at the third seat, Abarame Shibi was seated in the fourth seat, and Jinwei was seated in the fifth seat. On Naruto's right, Inazuka Sum was seated in the first seat, Hyuga Hyashi was seated in the second seat, Hawaido Suki was seated in the third seat, Kiraikoi was seated in the fourth seat, and Kataki Waga was seated in the fifth seat. At the head of the council table, Mitokado Homura sat on Sunid's right while Yutatane Koharu sat on her left. Sunid was the first to speak, Naruto, do you know why we had asked you to return to Kanoa? Naruto folded his arms and looked away, I'm here because the shinobi of the leaf are weak and you need me to save their asses. Everyone in the room with the exception of Sunid narrowed their eyes at Naruto. She just let out a sigh at his comment. Koharu spoke next, Uzumaki Naruto. You will show respect while you are in the presence of the council. It's true that your assistance is needed but you will show some respect. Naruto looked at the old woman and smiled, you talk to me as if I'm one of your shinobi. I don't have to show any of you any respect. You guys want my help, not the other way around. And besides, respect is earned, not given away so freely. Koharu was angry. She was about to say something when Hyashi decided to make comment, we have very competent ninjas. We thought that you would love the opportunity that we had decided to present to you. Naruto looked at Hyashi curiously, oh. What opportunity are you talking about? To become a shinobi of the leaf again. Sunid said proudly. Naruto looked at Sunid. So that's the opportunity that Hyuga was talking about. Wow. I really don't know what to say, Naruto replied with a hint of sarcasm. The council members did not catch it. Suki, a middle-aged woman with white-green hair and brown eyes looked at the QB container with a smile, you don't have to say anything. We will reinstate you as a leaf shinobi and promote you to Junin. Seeing as you're ranked as an S-class nin in the bingo book, it wouldn't be a problem to do so. You get to enjoy life in Kanoa like you did before you left. Naruto looked at Suki like he was about to cry with joy, I just want to say. Everyone in the council was smiling. They knew the boy would fight for them as long as they offered him the chance to return home. There was no way he was going to turn down this offer. On the other hand, Sunid wasn't fooled by Naruto's act for a minute. She looked at Naruto and knew what was coming. When hell freezes over, the council gasped in shock. They soon narrowed their eyes at the blonde. 
You kicked me out because you said I was the reason why everyone got injured in the mission to rescue Sasuke and it was also my fault for his defection. I'm sure we all know why you really banished me. But, I'm not going to get into that. As for being a shinobi of Kanoa, thanks but no thanks. Anoshi spoke, Naruto, be reasonable. What about your dream? Being a Kanoa ninja, you would once again have the chance to become Hokage. That dream died the day I was left to rot by this village. That day was also the birth of a new dream. And what was that dream? Tsunid questioned. To become the strongest ninja in the world, since that is no longer a dream and is now a reality, I really have no more dreams to pursue. There was laughter around the table from council members. Kataki Waga, an old man with grey hair, black eyes, and a scar on his cheek made a comment, you may be powerful kid, but you're not the strongest ninja in the world. Sunid and Jiraiya are still the best ninjas around. Just because you have that fox to draw power off doesn't make you the strongest. Hyashi spoke, that's borrowed strength. Don't sit here and get cocky, kid. Who said anything about using the QB? Yes, it's true that I can draw his power. But I haven't drawn his power ever since I was 12. I say I'm the strongest because I know what I'm capable of even without the fox's power. All of you, on the other hand, have no idea. Soon it ended their squabble, Naruto doesn't really want to become a ninja of Kanoa. Although it saddens me, I respect his wishes. For his services he has asked for a fee of 90 million yo. Mitokado Homura was outraged, we will not be bullied by some brat. This is an outrageous demand, Sunid. The vein on Sunid's head started to bulge. Not another word Homura. Although this is an outrageous demand, we did ask him for his help. Besides, Naruto's allegiance to Kanoa and his reputation might get the rain to force Cloud to sign a treaty of neutrality. The council knew she was right. It was no doubt that Naruto was feared throughout Rain, who was allied with the Cloud in this war. They knew this was the reason Sunid suggested that they offer Naruto to become a shinobi again. She also had feelings for the boy as well. Sunid spoke once more. All in favor for paying for the services of Uzumaki Naruto. Everyone raised their hand. Sunid smiled, well Naruto, we held up our end, so it's time you hold up yours. We will discuss the payment plan at a later date. You are to report to my office at 9am tomorrow morning where you will be placed on a team with Chunins and Junins. Tell me who I'm working with, and what the mission is. I'd rather know now. Well, you're teaming up with four Chunins and two Junins for this mission. Sunid replied. I asked who they were, not their ranks. For the sake of the mission, I need to know who they are and their capabilities. Sunid leaned back in her chair then spoke, very well. The members of your team will be, Saru Tobi Konohamaru, Udon, Hyuga Hanabi, Hyuga Hanata, Haruno Sakura, and Uchiha Sasuke, acting as squad leader. Naruto stroked his chin, why are there two Hyugas? Honestly, I think one Hyuga is enough. Hanata, in my opinion, should be adequate for this mission, the other Hyuga isn't really needed. Hyashi's anger was visible to everyone in the council. They all knew how highly he thought of Hanabi, and for Naruto to say that he preferred Hinata over Hanabi was crazy. Hyashi spoke, Hanabi is the best the Hyuga has to offer. If anything, Hinata is the one not needed on this mission. She is weak. If you're going to suggest a Hyuga, never suggest the weakest of them all. Naruto shook his head in agreement, you're right. Hyashi smiled at the boy. Naruto returned the smile, then spoke again. Since Neji is clearly the strongest Hyuga, why not have him replace them both? Shikaku actually smiled at Naruto's comment. He knew Naruto was getting under the skin of Hyashi. He also was glad that he had knocked him down a peg by stating that Neji, a member of the branch house, was stronger than the heir of the main house. Sunid wanted to laugh but decided to continue, Naruto, both Hyugas are capable. Neji isn't on this team because I need his presence elsewhere. This team I've selected is perfect for the mission at hand. Okay, please inform me of their skills, Naruto replied. Konohamaru's taijutsu is superb. His ninjutsu is a little above average and his genjutsu is mediocre. Udon is the strategist of this team. You have worked with Shikamaru, Udon is the next best thing. All of his other skills are mediocre. Udon may be good, but I would trust a plan developed by Shikamaru with my life. Anyway, please continue. Right. Hanabi is arguably the best Chunin in the village. Her Taijutsu skills are superb, and her ability to see through Genjutsu as well. 
Hinata is basically the same as Hanabi, but Hanabi's Taijutsu is slightly better. Sakura is the medic of the team. She will try not to fight but don't worry about protecting her. I've trained her so she is more than capable of handling herself. Sasuke is probably the best ninja in the village. Sasuke isn't really lacking in any skills. Okay, I think that's good enough. Chuza finally decided to speak, you know all of their skills, but nobody really knows yours. Tsunade looked at the big boned man, then back to Naruto, so, Naruto, what are your skills? Naruto stroked his chin again, well my taijutsu, in my opinion, is second to none, my ninjutsu is excellent, and although I'm not a master at genjutsu, I am exceptional in it and my kenjutsu is only second to one. Tsunade looked at Naruto. She wanted to question him more but knew she wouldn't get the answers she wanted so she decided to end the meeting. This meeting is over. Naruto, report to my office at 9am. I will tell you the mission overview then. Naruto got up and left the council room. Naruto exited the building and decided to head over to the hotel where his fiancée and her mother were. However, he smelt something that he hadn't smelt or eaten in a long time. Ichiraku Ramen. Naruto walked in and took a seat. The old man who ran the shop was behind the counter cooking. He heard the person come in. He didn't turn around to greet the person. Welcome to Ichiraku, how may I help you? Naruto spoke, old man, you can start by getting your number one customer a big bowl of miso ramen. The old man turned around once he heard the guy say he was his number one customer. When he saw the blonde sitting there, he was excited with joy. Naruto, it's good to see you, this place wasn't the same without you. Well, I had no control over that. But I'm here now and I haven't had a good bowl of ramen in six years. Well, don't worry, this one is on the house. I'm just glad you're back, the old man said. Naruto just smiled at the old man. He was happy to be back at the stand. This place was his safe haven while living in this village. Naruto looked all over the shop but couldn't find what he was looking for. Hey, where is Ayami Nei-chan? Looking for me. Naruto turned to where he heard the voice. He saw Ayami standing by the door, which lead to the storage at the back of the shop, in her apron. She really didn't change all that much in his opinion. If anything she looked better than what he remembered. Ayami Nei-chan, it's so glad to see you. I've really missed you and the old man. Ayami smiled, I missed you too Naruto-kun. Anyway, what brings you back into town? Naruto face became serious, just business. I don't know how long I will be here, but I'm leaving when my job is complete. That's too bad. Father and I really missed you. Well, Naruto I have a lot of work to do, but please come by the shop again so we can catch up, okay? Naruto smiled at the girl, will do. See you later Naruto-kun, she waved and headed back to the storage area at the back of the shop. Later, Ayami Nei-chan. While Naruto was chowing down, the old man leaned on the counter. She's right you know. Things haven't been the same since you left. I heard what happened, if there was anything that I could have done. He cut the old man off, don't worry about it. I know you would have. Well, I have to go, thanks for the meal. Naruto got up from the chair and headed to the hotel. As he was walking he could see the people staring at him. Not the same cold stares, those stares were out of curiousness. He figured it wouldn't be long till word got out about him. Naruto stopped and looked at the hotel, he had finally arrived. After asking the receptionist what room Yumi and Mai was in, he headed to the room. Mai was in the room next to Yumi. Naruto knocked on the door to Yumi's room. At the door stood the prettiest woman he would ever see. Hey, sweetie, she embraced him in a hug. After they broke away they entered the room. Yumi decided to speak, Naruto-kun, are you okay? I was so worried about you. I'm fine. Anyway, what did you do in the hour that I was gone? Yumi walked to the bed and sat down. Not much really. I was waiting for you to come back so that you could show me around. I mean, if that's okay with you. She knew Naruto's history so she didn't want to force him into showing her around. Naruto, who was leaning against the wall, walked up and sat next to Yumi. Okay, I'll show you around if that's what you want. Besides, there's one person I want you to meet. She looked at him with a questionable look, who might this person be? Aruka sensei I haven't seen him in a while and I want you to meet him. She smiled, sure. But can we go before it gets dark? What about your mother? Maybe she wants to come with us. Naruto said. 
She asked that guy with the white eyes to show her to the bathhouse. But the girl with the blonde hair volunteered. Quote. Naruto knew that she was talking about Ino. He knew Ino wouldn't pass up on this opportunity to try and get Mai to tell her about himself. Naruto didn't worry about it. Mai didn't know what he did prior to meeting her and Yumi. Ino was fishing in a pond with no fish. He laughed in his head knowing that the girl would be mad when she didn't get the information she wanted. The couple exited the hotel and was walking through the busy village. Naruto grabbed Yumi's hand while they walked down the street. Naruto felt he was being watched. Judging by the stealth of the person he knew that it was his old Junin instructor. He stopped. Yumi got curious then looked at Naruto. Naruto-kun, why did we stop? Is something wrong? Naruto looked down at the woman who was a head shorter than him. No, nothing's wrong. We're just being followed. But don't worry, we're not in any danger. With that said Naruto turned to face straight ahead, Kakashi, Asuma, Kurenai, and Guy, you can all come out now. Asuma appeared directly in front of Naruto, Guy appeared on Yumi's left, Kurenai on Naruto's right and Kakashi was lying in the tree pretending to read his book. Yo, Naruto, Kakashi folded his book and appeared next Asuma. What do you want Hitaki? Kakashi had expected that from Naruto. Kurenai was looking in awe at how much Naruto had grown. She thought that if he was a couple of years older and she wasn't seeing Asuma, she would consider dating him. Guy spoke in his usual manner, Naruto, it's so good to see you again. Are you enjoying your springtme of youth? It's good to have you as a leaf ninja again. Naruto looked at Guy with a serious look, I'm not a leaf shinobi. Asuma responded in shock, what? I thought that they reinstated you. Naruto turned to Asuma. They wanted to reinstate me but I declined. Why would you do that Naruto? Kurenai asked. Do you actually think that I would want to be a shinobi of this village after what had happened six years ago? I'm not fighting for this village out of love or loyalty. I'm only here to fulfill my end of a deal. Kakashi spoke, so, what is the deal that has brought you back here? I'm being paid 90 million yo for my services. After the job is done, I'm leaving this place, he said in disgust. Kurenai was shocked that he was being paid that much, but more shocked that the council had approved. Naruto was getting annoyed, to say the very least. Kakashi, if you don't want anything, please leave me alone. Kakashi looked at Naruto. Then he looked at the girl who was holding onto his left arm, Naruto, who's your friend? This is Yumi, my fiancé. Kurenai looked at the girl. She knew her former student was going to be crushed when she found out that Naruto was engaged. She knew how much the girl cared for Naruto and how hurt and depressed she was when he left. Kurenai remembered it had taken the girl almost a year to get out of her depression. Guy gave Naruto the nice guy pose, Naruto, you were chosen a beautiful flower to share the springtime of youth with. Um, thanks guy, Naruto replied with a clueless expression. Asuma spoke, Naruto you've made quite a name for yourself. You asked Kakashi, what we wanted, well the reason we're here is. Naruto interjected, you're here to measure my skills. I knew that soon it would send somebody to test my skills. No matter, you guys won't see much. I don't intend to break a sweat. Kakashi looked at Naruto with wonder. He wondered if Naruto really came so far that he could dispatch four of Kanoa's elites. Asuma broke his concentration. I don't think we will be that easy to beat. Naruto replied, let's get this over with, okay. I promised Yumi that I would show her around. Kakashi decided to speak, meet us at Team 7's former training ground. With that, all four Junin vanished. Naruto looked at Yumi, walk around and have fun. I'll find you when I'm done. How long do you think you're going to be? Five, ten minutes tops. Naruto replied. Okay, but you better be back by that time. You know how I hate it when you're late, right? Yumi glared dangerously at Naruto. The blonde warrior gulped. He would rather face an army of hockages than face an upset Yumi. Don't worry, I'll be back within that time. I promise. He kissed her cheek and was off. She looked at the town to see so many shops. She decided to walk until she saw a clothes shop. Team 7 training ground. Naruto appeared a minute after Kakashi, Kurenai, Asuma, and Guy did. Naruto was standing in the middle while being surrounded by the four Junins. Kakashi lifted up his Hitayat to reveal his Sharingan. Guy took a fighting stance, Kurenai did the same. Asuma pulled out his knuckle knives. 
Kakashi and Guy were standing in front him, while Kurenai and Asuma stood behind him. Kurenai started it off by creating an illusion. Naruto was impressed to say the least. Everyone disappeared from view. All he saw was a barren wasteland devoid of everything. He knew his eyes were deceiving him, so he pulled a black cloth out of his pocket and covered his eyes. Kurenai took to the trees after her jutsu took effect. She was watching and wondering why he did that. She then realized he was blocking his vision. She didn't believe he could beat the illusion by doing this. She knew better than anyone that the illusion also messes with you hearing and sense of smell as well. The only people that could defeat this genjutsu were Uchiha's, Hyuga's, and people who were masters of genjutsus. Naruto was impressed but he knew that this was no ordinary genjutsu. He knew that everything that he smelled and heard were distractions from his real targets. But as good of a genjutsu this was, Naruto knew that this wouldn't work on him. He decided who would be the first one he would take out. Naruto vanished from everyone's sight. Kakashi realized where Naruto went. His eyes went wide, he looked at the tree Kurenai was in. Kurenai watch out. She turned her head to face the person behind her. Black and gold would be the last thing she would see. Naruto hit her in the back of her neck. He placed his sword back on his back. He then grabbed her and leapt down to the ground where they were still watching. He laid her down in the middle of the field. That genjutsu was one of the strongest I've ever faced. But no genjutsu will be effective against me. I may not be that good at performing them, but I mastered a way to counter all of them. Since the nuisance is out of the way, let us continue. Naruto took off the blindfold. Asuma was shocked that Naruto had broken Kurenai's strongest genjutsu. How the hell did you break it? No one with the exception of the Uchiha and the Hyuga could break that jutsu. Naruto looked at Asuma, your eyes aren't the only thing to see with. There is one thing that a ninja can't mask no matter what and that is their chakra signature. I knew where you all were at because I could sense your chakra. So now that you know how I broke it, care to continue. Kakashi formed hand seals. He then shouted Katen, Hausen can no jutsu, Naruto flipped out of the way of the fireballs that were heading his way. He jumped into a tree only to find Asuma behind him. Asuma threw a kick with his left leg. Naruto side flipped out of the tree back onto the training ground. Guy appeared on his right. He threw a punch that Naruto ducked under. But before Naruto could counter, he saw two kunais heading in his direction from his left. The kunai hit him dead on. Guy jumped back after seeing Naruto was hit. It's over, Naruto. Naruto looked up at Guy and smirked, sorry Guy, but I'm not the real one, the clone then puffed out of existence. Kakashi, who had thrown the kunai, had his eyes widened when he realized what Naruto had done. If anyone could see under his mask, they would have seen him smiling. All Guy saw was Asuma falling out of the tree. He was clearly out cold. Naruto landed next to Asuma. And then there was two. Before we continue, Guy, could you take off your weights? I would like to fight you at your fullest. Guy gave Naruto the nice guy pose, since you ask so nicely I will do so. Guy took off the rest of his weights. Kakashi appeared next to Guy. He whispered so Naruto couldn't hear the two. Listen Guy, he's better than I expected him to be. Keep your guard up. Guy shook his head. He dashed off to face Naruto. Guy threw a kick with his right foot. Naruto blocked. Guy was moving so fast that Naruto found himself on the defensive. He knew Guy was fast, but this was incredible. Naruto blocked a punch, but he wasn't so lucky with the next punch. Naruto, my taijutsu is superior to yours. But, I will say that you are extremely talented, however you lack the speed. Naruto smirked, then let's say I get rid of my ankle weights. I would get rid of the rest, but judging by your speed without your weights, that won't be necessary. Naruto took of the sticker scrolls that were taped on the inside of his sandals. He looked at Guy before blurring out of sight. He appeared in front of Guy with his hand planted in the man's stomach. Guy looked in shock before he fell over, clutching his stomach. Naruto then turned his attention to Kakashi. Kakashi and Naruto took to the air, Kakashi threw a punch which Naruto blocked with ease, and he flipped over Kakashi's punch landing in front of a tree. As soon as the copy ninja landed, he threw at least seven shuriken. Naruto dodged them all. The white-haired ninja was expecting him to, for Naruto wasn't his real target. Naruto realized his mistake but the wires wrapped around him, pinning him to the tree. Kakashi walked up to Naruto, you did well, but you failed to look underneath the underneath. 
Naruto just looked at Kakashi, no, I did. But maybe you should. Naruto turned into a log of wood. A pair of hands broke through the ground and grabbed his feet. Before he could move he felt the blade of a sword pressed against his throat. This is over Kakashi, you all lose. If this was a real mission you would all be dead. Kakashi was shocked to say the least. When did you make a clone? When I saw you throwing the shuriken, I used Kawarimi, then I made a clone to grab you from underground. That was all the time I needed to get behind you. Naruto placed the sword back in its holster. Kakashi turned around to face him. You've gotten better. I heard the rumors and assumed you were good, but I didn't expect you to be this good. Well I've been training my ass off since I left here. Anyway, as fun as it was to beat all of you guys in A. Naruto looked at his wristwatch, 7 minute span, I really have to get back to Yumi. Later, with that Naruto disappeared. On a tree nearby, soon it watched the whole thing in awe. She had just witnessed Naruto dispatch four of Kanoa's elite junins without even breaking a sweat. She spoke out loud to no one in particular. How did he get so strong? He has trained himself beyond human limits. She looked over to her right to see a man she hadn't seen in approximately six years. The only word that she could utter was, Jiraiya. Sunid looked over the man that was once her teammate. To her, not much had changed about him. He still wore the exact same outfit that he wore before he left the village, vowing to not return again. She wondered if he still sees her as a friend or as traitor of some sorts. After all, wasn't this how Naruto saw her? Jiraiya decided to break the silence. It's been a while, Sunid. Yes, it most certainly has. What brings you back? She asked. Jiraiya, who was leaning against a tree, broke eye contact with the woman before him to look off into space. Well, I haven't seen my student in six months. I decided it would be nice to see him. She had a sad look on her face, oh. Is that the only reason? He decided to meet her eyes again, no. The slug princess was now curious, then, what is your other reason? My other reason is to be able to tell you not to do it. She had an idea of what he was getting at. Jiraiya, probably more so than anyone else, knew how she felt about Naruto. Sunid knew, deep down, why Jiraiya told her not to do it, but she decided to question it anyway. Why shouldn't I do it, huh? Give me one good reason. His eyes visibly showed his anger. Give you a reason. I can give you a whole list of reasons but I won't. But I will give you a reason that should be good enough. For the first time in his life, he is happy. Don't try to ruin his happiness, please. Sunid looked at her feet. Jiraiya, he belongs home in this village. I have to try and make him see that. I just wish. The toad hermit stopped her before she could finish. You just wish that you can correct your mistake. Unlike Dan and Nawaki, where you didn't have control over the situations, Sunid tensed up the mention of her lover and brother, you had full control over the situation with Naruto. Sunid knew everything Jiraiya had said was right. She could have forced the council to give in but instead, she had agreed to banish Naruto. She never had any intention on making his banishment permanent, she was going to have him return in a couple of years and tell everyone of his heritage. She believed that this would make people accept him more. A tear fell down her cheek. I did what I felt was best for Naruto and the village at the time. Naruto needed to get away and I believed that in time the villagers would get over what they believed Naruto to be. I sent some of his friends to search for him after three years had passed. They never were able to find him because he covered up his track so well. I planned on telling the village of his heritage when he returned. She turned to Jiraiya with tears falling down her face freely, Jiraiya, please understand that I never wanted to hurt him. I love him as if he was my own son. He is the only reason why I have remained Hokage. My goal is to free this village of its hate. Jiraiya, I fear that I have lost the chance to make amends. It hurts because I'm the one who has caused him more pain. Jiraiya, I don't know what to do. The blonde placed her hands in her face to grieve. Jiraiya decided to jump to the branch that she was on to console her. He wrapped his arms around her and let her cry in his chest. I thought that you wanted him to serve the village because of his skills. I didn't know that you were doing this because you believed it would benefit him. Now I know what you're really after, Jiraiya stated. Sunid looked up into his eyes, Jiraiya, how can I get him to stay? This village needs him more than ever. He carries the will of the fire in him. It's going to be hard to get him to return. 
You will have to sit down with him and talk to him and explain why you did what you did. I know you care about him but he feels that you had betrayed him. Honestly, I thought you did too. Now that I had heard your reasons for doing what you did, you did what you felt was best, even if it was a wrong decision. Did you ever tell him about his father? She questioned while wiping away her tears. Jiraiya broke the embrace between the two of them, I was planning on telling him of his heritage this year. His father knew that his enemies would harm his son with him gone, so he wanted Naruto to be told when he was 18. He figured Naruto would be strong enough to handle his enemies by then. He willed me and Sarutobi sensei to let Naruto know of his heritage when he became of age. I'm curious, how did you find out that Yondime was Naruto's father? I have access to the Hokage's personal files. It was only a matter of time before I found out who his parents were. But it was smart of Sarutobi sensei to change his last name. Even though they look alike, people wouldn't question it because they simply had different last names. She replied. Yay. That was for Naruto's protection as well. He decided to give the boy his mother's maiden name. Only Sarutobi sensei and I knew who Naruto's mother was. Minato kept that hidden from everyone else. There was no way anyone could have figured it out, it was set up perfectly. Tsunade spoke once more, well it wasn't set up that perfect. One person did manage to figure it out. Jiraiya was shocked to say the least. He wondered who was smart enough to figure it out. Really, who is this person? He's Kanoa's lead strategist. She replied. What's his name? He asked. Nara Shikamaru. Somewhere across town in a barbecue shack. A Hakua, a young man, with a lazy look thought, my allergies must be acting up again. How troublesome. Back to across town, at the trees near training ground 7. How did he figure it out? Jiraiya asked. He said he put two and two together. He came to my office about two weeks after Naruto left. Flashback. Sunid was sitting at her desk in her office. She was going over the decision she made two weeks ago. Sunid's assistant, Shizun, came in her office holding a cute little pig in her arms. Sunid Sama, Nara Shikamaru is here to see you. The god I motioned for her to send him in. Nara Shikamaru stood before her in his tune and vest. She motioned for him to take a seat. What brings you here, Shikamaru? I wish to ask you a personal question. She rested her elbows on the desk. She then placed her head on the back of her hands for support. What is your question? Why did you kick Naruto out this village knowing the sacrifice that his father made to protect it? She decided to make up a factious story about Naruto parents so the boy wouldn't press the matter further. What are talking about? Naruto was an orphan, no one know who his parents are. Shikamaru looked at her with a serious look, you can play dumb all you want, but I know the truth. You're right, Naruto was an orphan. But I started to think, why did the villagers hate Naruto so much? I mean, he was a prankster, but that's not a good enough reason to hate him as much as the villagers did. So I started putting things together. Sunid knew where he was going with this. She prayed that she was wrong. So, tell me, what did you find out? First I remembered our academy days. My parents and most of the parents, correction all of the parents, told their kids to stay away from him because he was nothing but trouble. I also overheard some old man calling him a good-for-nothing monster. But why would they call him that? This is a theory you came up with so you tell me, the Hockage stated. The lazy tune and continued, it wasn't until recently that I started to think things over, before it was just too troublesome. Then it all hit me like a ton of bricks. The one clue that put all of the pieces together was the fact about Naruto's birthday. It's not unusual for someone to be born October 10th, but he was born exactly when the QB attacked. I only knew his birthday because I overheard Hinata asking Aruka-sensei his birthday. She never specified her real reason but I figured out her reason when he came to class the next day sporting a pair of goggles on his head, telling Aruka that someone gave him a birthday gift. You're rambling, Nara. Godime stated in a bored tone. I suppose. But here is what I came up with. There was no way the fourth could kill the QB. Do you doubt his skills? No. Just stating a fact. I did some research of my own. I asked Gara's sister about the demon that was sealed inside of him. I asked her why didn't they kill it like the Yondime had killed the QB. She laughed at me and told me that there was no way for a human to kill a demon. She believed that the fourth had to seal it inside of something. 
I was informed the demon that was inside of Gara was the one-tailed demon Shukaku. I thought it was too troublesome to argue about how the fourth had killed the nine tails. But she made me wonder, how do you kill a demon? So I started to research demons. She was right there is no way you can kill a demon. Since Kyuubi is the strongest of the tailed beasts, the only way he could be defeated was by being sealed inside something. You can't seal it in an adult because the adult would die. The only feasible option is a newborn so both the demon and the newborn's chakra could fuse. What are you getting at, Nara? She stated in a tone that was openly showed that her patience was wearing thin. Naruto is hated by the village. His birthday is the day the QB attack. The red chakra he used to beat Neji in the Chunin exams. What I'm getting at is that Naruto is the container for the QB and the son of Yondaim Hokage. There was a minute of silence. How did you know? She questioned. Know that he was the son of the fourth. Yes, tell me how. She asked. After I figured out he was the container for the QB, the rest fell into place. Everyone said the fourth was an honorable man, so there is no way he would ask a villager to sacrifice one of their babies. So I figured he would sacrifice his own son instead. Also the blonde hair and blue eyes are a dead giveaway. The god I'm spoke, you know all this, what else do you know? Well that's where you come in to fill in the blanks. You see, I know that Yondime's name was Namika's Minato. The history files never said anything about him having a kid or even a wife. So I looked up the name Uzumaki in the historical archives and found the name of a woman called Uzumaki Kushina. I figure that she is Naruto's mother and the fourth's wife. You seem to know more than you should, what do you need me to fill in? She questioned. Why were his marriage and his son hidden from the village? Sunid got up to look out the window. She looked at the setting sun. With her hands behind her back she kept her gaze at the sky. Sunid spoke, I don't know why his marriage was hidden, but if I had to guess, it was to protect his wife from his enemies. As for Naruto, I suspect Sandime had a hand in covering up his heritage to the village. I believe he did this for the same reason that the Yondime covered up his marriage. It makes sense. Yondime did have many enemies because of the Iwakanoa War. What better way to get payback on a man than to go after his family? The lazy Chunin replied. She turned to Shikmaru, you seem to know everything I know. As for me banishing Naruto, it was for his own good as well as the village. This village hates him, so I sent him away in hopes he would get stronger. I know Jiraiya is keeping tabs on him so I don't have to worry about his safety. When the time is right I plan to send for him to tell him and the village everything. Well if that is all then you are dismissed. Shikmaru got up out of the chair and left the office. End of flashback. So you do know me as well as I thought. The perverted hermit responded. I knew you wouldn't leave him to die. Sunid stated. Well I did keep tabs on him, but I wasn't with him. Let's just say that I influenced his training more than he knows. How so? She questioned. Jiraiya responded, well, I followed him to water country. There I met up with an old friend by the name of Seiki Kaito. Her eyes widened, one of the seven swordsmen of the mist. Last I heard, he was a ruthless miss and nin. No, he just left his country because he discovered the corruption of his village and the Mizukage. Since he owed me a favor, I asked him to train Naruto in the art of the sword. I also asked that he teach him some water Eustace and better Chaka control. He complied and kept me updated on Naruto's performance. He left Kaito after two years of training with him and doing missions. Wait a minute, he was only 14 then. What did he do during the next year? She asked. Well he went to see country. I got word that that was where he was heading so I asked a dear friend of mine by the name Raiho to finish up his sword training. The perverted hermit replied. Impossible. There is no way that a samurai, and the best one in the world at that, would train a ninja in his art, stated the god I'm bluntly. Well he was returning a favor, not to me anyways. You see Minato had introduced him to his wife so I suggested it was only right that he return the favor by training Minato's only son. I also informed him to keep Naruto's heritage a secret. We set it up so that he challenged Naruto to a sword fight. He won of course and offered to train Naruto. Because of his previous sword training under Kaito, it only took him a year to master the style. So he wasn't kidding when he said that his sword skills were only second to one, stated the slug princess. Nope, the kid really is a great swordsman. Anyway, the day he left the Manashu clan, I was waiting for him outside of the compound. 
I informed it was time to finish his training. For the next year I worked him into the ground. When he left me there was no doubt in my mind that he was one of the strongest fighters in the world, he said confidently. I knew you would protect him. I'm just glad it was long enough for us to defeat Akatsuki and the sound. If they would have got him, I don't know what I would have done. Jiraiya spoke once more, well, he was the reason you guys beat Akatsuki in the first place. Her curiosity forced her to ask, how do you figure so? Well, he did take out three of four of the key members. He took out Kazuya Ang, Iwas, Gemstone, Bai Hoshu of the Rain, and the leader Sako Tosku, the clouds, red lighting, he stated. Jiraiya, out of the top five S-class criminals in the bingo book, you just named three. Those fighters would be hard for even us to beat. The slug princess stated. The only ones who could give us a run for our money is, Red Lighting, Orokimaru, and Itachi. He replied. Well since all of them are dead, the only ones who could give us a run for our money now are Sasuke and Naruto. She stated. So he did kill Itachi. You know Orokimaru only went after him because he couldn't defeat Itachi. Jiraiya replied. Yay. That's what I figured. Anyway, those two are probably stronger than us now, told the white-haired man. Jiraiya wondered if Sunid was going to retire soon. He knew that she always wanted to give her position Naruto, but since he was no longer a member of the village, she wondered who she would select to be the Rokudime Hokage. Sunid, have chosen decided who will replace you as Hokage. She simply replied, no. There was an uncomfortable silence. The wind began to pick up rustling her blonde pigtails and her green robe and his white hair as well his red robe. So are just going leave the position unfilled. She responded, I already told the council that I will not be selecting a successor. So they have decided to select Uchiha Sasuke as the Rokudime. You already know who I wanted to replace me. Giving her a light-hearted smile, he placed a hand on her shoulder, yeah, I do. Anyway, let's get out of this tree and head to a local bar. I think we could both use some sake. She smiled at the white-haired man, sounds like a great plan. Jiraiya and Sunid jumped out of the trees and headed back to the town. Naruto had just finished his fight with Kakashi and the other Junins. He was now looking for Yumi, but he couldn't find her anywhere. He looked at his watch and knew that his ten minutes were almost up. Think Naruto, where the hell could she be? In that instant he got it. He ran to the nearest clothing shop in the area. Naruto entered the shop and found Yumi looking at some shirts. He let out a sigh of relief. He decided to slide behind put his hands over her eyes, guess who? Yumi smiled already knowing it was her loving Naruto, I suspect it's my Naruto-kun, but he said that he would be here in 5 minutes. Oh that's right, you said 10 minutes max. I guess they must have been good if they kept you for more than 5 minutes. Either that or you're not a very good ninja. Naruto took his hand away from her eyes. She turned to face him so she could look him in the eyes when spoke. That was cold, Yumi. But I'll show you how great of a ninja I am. She quirked her eyebrow, how do you intend to do that, Uzumaki-sama? He gave her an evil smile, like this. He started tickling her all over. She was helpless to do anything but giggle. He finally stopped with a satisfied smirk. The great Uzumaki is always triumphant in the end. She walked up to him and tiptoed to his ear to speak so no one could but him, you may have won the battle, but my lingerie will win the war. I see. It seems that I will never win a war against you, he said in a defeated tone. She walked back to look at the clothes. She then turned her head slightly to reveal a smile that spread across her face, nope, not ever. He scratched the back of his head, a habit which had survived with him from his genin days. Well I guess I can live with that. Are you almost done? I want to go see Aruka sensei Actually I've been done for a while, I was just waiting for you. Yumi replied. Really, where are the shopping bags? Naruto questioned. I had them delivered to the hotel. There was a little boy in here looking for some clothes so I asked him if he would take my clothes back the hotel for me. I paid him for his service of course. When we return, I'll just pick them up at the front desk. Okay. Let's go. Naruto extended his hand for Yumi to grab. They exited the shop and headed to the academy. It was late in the afternoon and class was already out. Naruto knew that Aruka would be grading papers in his class. Naruto and Yumi arrived at the academy. Naruto was taking in his surroundings and reminiscing his childhood. Although he did have a bad childhood, there were some good times. 
he remember a time when Chuji, Shikamaru, Kiba, and himself had ditched Aruka and ran out of the classroom after he had given him an important lecture. He entered the class but he didn't see Aruka. He saw a bowl of ramen on the side of a desk filled with paper. He guessed Aruka had stepped out for a second so he decided to look around. He looked at the seats which were the same. He looked at the seat that him and Chuji used to sit in and exchange snacks. He looked up to the seat at the back of the class where him and Shikamaru uses to sleep. He smiled to himself, those were the good times. Unknowingly to Naruto and Yumi, a man with a hairstyle that resembled a pineapple and a scar lying across his nose entered the room. Excuse me, may I help the two of you? Aruka asked. Yumi turned her gaze from the window to the man who had entered the room. Naruto however, decided not to turn around. He just closed his eyes and smiled, it's been a while, eh, hey, Aruka-sensei. Naruto turned around to face the man he saw as a father figure. Aruka gasped in shock. He couldn't believe the person before his eyes. After looking Naruto up and down to make sure it was him he revealed a smile, Naruto is it really you? The one and only, he replied proudly. Aruka and Naruto seemed to move simultaneously. They embraced each other in a hug, which was to be expected since they hadn't seen each other in years. They broke their embrace. Aruka was the first to speak, Naruto how you been? I was worried sick, where did you go, are you okay? A drop of sweat appeared on the back of Naruto's head. Slow down. He gathered himself. I've been good. Did you get the letters that I sent you? Each one that you sent me. I just wish you left an address so I could write back. The academy teacher replied. Aruka looked at Naruto. He realized that there was a lady standing next to him. Naruto, who is your friend? Oh, where are my manners? Aruka-sensei, this Isumi. Yumi, meet Aruka-sensei. Naruto introduced the two. They both shook hands. So this is the Yumi that I've been hearing so much about in your letters. Naruto, you have a beautiful girlfriend, Aruka complimented. Yumi blushed, why thank you, sir. And soon to be wife. Naruto muttered softly so no one could hear. Please, just call me Aruka. Naruto spoke before silence could take over. Aruka-sensei, I assume you gave me up to a bar chan Aruka looked like he was about to apologize but Naruto cut him off before he could say anything, don't worry about it. I know you wouldn't have done it if you thought that they were going to hurt me. Aruka spoke, I only did it because they said that they was going to reinstate you as ninja again. I know it's selfish but I just wanted you back home so I could see you. Don't worry, I'm here for the time being. I've got a feeling I'm going to be here for a while so we will definitely have time to catch up. The ninja known as the Golden Fox replied. Naruto grabbed Yumi's hand and they both headed towards the exit. Aruka spoke before they left, Naruto, it is really good to see you again. Naruto stopped at the doorway. It's good to see you too Aruka-sensei, it's good to see you too. Naruto and Yumi exited the classroom. Aruka went back to his desk and returned to grading papers. He opened his desk drawer to reveal a blue Hittite with the leaf symbol engraved on the metal plate. He smiled at the sight of the blue headband. After closing the drawer he returned back to grading papers. At a local barbecue shack. Sitting at a table, with a grill in the middle, that seated at least 12, were 12 Junins. The Junins that were sitting at the restaurants were, Mitminato Anko, Yuhi Kuranai, Sarutobi Asuma, Hitaki Kakashi, Maito Gai, Genma, Hyuga Neji, Ebisu, Narashi Kamaru, Akamaiki Chuji, Tenten, and Rock Lee. Guy was telling all of those who had not participated in the skirmish with Naruto about how easily they were defeated. Everyone, with the exception of Kuranai, Asuma, and Kakashi, was shocked. Impossible. There is no way he could beat all four of you. Anko stated. I wish that was true, Anko, but he made us look like rookies who didn't know their place. Asuma said while preparing to smoke a cigarette. He's that good Anko. He even broke my powerful genjutsu. Kuranai replied. Everyone was shocked. The senban fell out of Genma's mouth. Kuranai was the village's genjutsu specialist. To hear that Naruto broke her most powerful genjutsu was surprising. Shikamaru decided to speak, I bet the Hokage put you up to the troublesome task of testing Naruto's abilities. Yes, she did. Truth be told, I didn't expect him to improve that much. If I had to guess, I would say he's on par with Sasuke. Kakashi replied. Ebisu spoke, you may be right. 
Neji, who was sipping his tea, put it down to speak, I don't know what his skill level is now but he most certainly improved. He looked at Tenten and Shikamaru, you two had to notice it when we were sent to retrieve him. Tenten wondered what Neji was getting at, what do you mean Neji? Shikamaru answered, he means how Naruto was able to get behind Ino without her even noticing until the kunai was at her neck. To tell you the truth, I don't think my shadow bind would have held him if he was serious. He even knew who we were. He called all of us out, remember. Asuma, remembering what Naruto had said before he knocked Kurenai out, well he did say something about seeing without your eyes before he knocked Kurenai out. What do you think he meant by that? Lee questioned. Kakashi decided to answer, he told us that he was able to sense our chakra signatures. I'm guessing that's how he was able to defeat Kurenai's Genjutsu. Well I wonder who is stronger, Naruto or Sasuke? Anko questioned. Tenten responded, probably Sasuke, he did defeat Itachi who was said to be even stronger than Orokimaru. Anko looked at Tenten, you're probably right. Sasuke-kun is in line to be the next Hokage. He also knows tons of Jutsus. Neji wasn't so sure that Sasuke was stronger. He knew that Naruto was playing with him and the others back in Sun Country. He knew there was a lot more to Naruto than met the eye. Well that might be a fight we, LLC in the near future. They are going on a mission together tomorrow. Shikamaru said. Tenten spoke, they were teammates, I'm sure that they won't fight. You're wrong, Kakashi interrupted. Sasuke and Naruto are rivals. Although they worked well together when the situation called for it, they always were trying to outdo the other. They always fought each other. I think Naruto was the reason Sasuke defected in the first place. What do you mean? Kurenai wondered. Sasuke was always number one in his class. Naruto was the dead last. Sasuke saw that Naruto was improving greatly and thought that he wasn't progressing fast enough. The day after Sunid had returned I found them on the roof fighting. I had to interject before they killed each other. Sasuke with a Chidori in his left hand was about to collide with a Raisingan in Naruto's right hand. He knows the Raisingan. Anko yelled out. Almost everyone at the table were shocked while some were confused. What is the Raisingan? Chuji asked with food in his mouth. I think it's a swirling ball of chakra gathered in the hand. Am I correct, Kakashi? Shikamaru questioned. Yes, but how do you know he knew that technique? He used it on one of the sound nins on our mission to retrieve Sasuke. Shikamaru explained. It's also an A-rank jutsu only known to Jiraiya-sama and the Yondaim. Kurenai replied. A fight between the two is almost inevitable. Kakashi stated. Well, Sasuke did defeat Gara, who has Shukaku sealed inside of him, so I'm sure he can best even Naruto. Tenten stated. You're wrong, Shikmaru stated. Wrong about Sasuke being able to beat Naruto. Tenten replied. No, you're wrong about Sasuke defeating Gara. Naruto was the one who defeated Gara. Everyone at the table was in shock. Kakashi was curious because he had always thought that Sasuke defeated Gara. All of the villagers had thought that it was their precious Uchiha. Shikamaru was one of the few that knew the truth. Tamari saw the whole battle. She told me that Naruto saved Sasuke from being killed by Gara. Well, here's how she described it. Gara had jumped at Sasuke again but Sakura jumped in front of him. He slammed her into a tree. He used a giant hand made out of sand to press her against the tree and render her unconscious. I was also told that Naruto created at least 50 cage bunshin. He then proceeded to beat Gara. When Gara transformed in O oh, his Shukaku state, Naruto summoned a giant toad. Naruto can summon Gambunta as well. Kurenai asked with wide eyes. Not surprising, seeing as Jiraiya Sama trained him for the third round of the Chunin exams, Ebisu stated. I thought that you trained him Ebisu. Kakashi asked. Well I was going to. I decided to work on his chakra control, so I took him to the hot springs. I figured that it would give him more incentive to stay above water since the water there was hot. Sure, that's the reason. Pervert, Genma said, nudging him in the waist, grinning. I'm not a pervert. I did it for his benefit, really. Anyway, we met Jiraiya-sama there and he took over Naruto's training. Well like I was saying, Temari said Naruto summoned a huge frog to fight Gara. Long story short, Naruto defeated Gara, not everyone's precious Uchiha. Shikamaru finished. What's that supposed to mean? Anko asked with a little anger in her voice. 
Shikamaru stood up, it's too troublesome to explain. Besides, I have to hand in my mission reports or I will see you guys. Shikamaru headed to the exit. Naruto and Yumi were walking down the street. Since the sun was setting, they decided to head back to the hotel. Naruto heard a woman's voice call his name him and Yumi turned around to see a brunette with clouds cover her private areas. Naruto just smiled. Yumi was furious at the woman. Until she transformed into a teenage boy with the standard uniform of a leaf chunin. Naruto ni san, that was a smoker of a jutsu, eh? The teen stated. Naruto just smiled, Konohamaru, I'm not a kid anymore so I forbid you to use that ridiculous jutsu. Yumi was thinking to herself, that is a pathetic ninja technique if I ever see one. It's appalling to all women. That's something a pervert would use and enjoy. Good thing my Naruto isn't the category of the former or the latter. She was pleased with her husband to be. Naruto pumped his fist and screamed, now let me show you the ultimate oriokei, sexy, no jutsu ever created to man. Realizing what Naruto had said, Yumi responded with a slap to the back of his head. Barker, if I ever catch you doing somehting as ridiculous as that, you can forget about ever touching me again. Naruto recovered from the smack. He then greeted Konohamaru, hey Konohamaru, how's it hanging? Pretty good bro, I heard we're doing a mission together tomorrow. It's going to be wicked awesome to work with you bro. I know you have tones of kick-ass jutsus. Konohamaru said with excitement. Yeah, I know a lot of jutsus. Maybe I can show you one, Naruto said. Yumi glared at him, it better not be the one that you were talking about earlier. Or else. Naruto put his hand up in defense, no, 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 it's something different completely. Konohamaru spoke, hey bro, who's the hot chick? Is she your? Konohamaru showed Naruto his pinky. Grinning from ear to ear, Naruto replied, yep. I did pretty well for myself don't you think? What about you Konohamaru, do you have a special girl? Well, I like Hyuga Hanabi, but I don't think she likes anyone. She acts as if she's too good to socialize with me. But for some reason I still like her. Konohamaru confessed his feeling toward the Hyuga heir to Naruto. Don't worry Konohamaru, most Hyugas are snobs. If you can't convince her to see how great you are then it's her loss. Naruto gave his opinion. Naruto and Konohamaru were smiling. Both of their ninja senses kicked in, they quickly turned to the right to see five kunais coming in their direction. Naruto grabbed Yumi before she knew what was going on and flipped out of the way. Konohamaru sensed the kunais and flipped out of the way. Naruto landed a foot away from where the kunai was embedded into the floor. He looked to the direction where kunai came from. On the roof stood a man with a junin vest, black sweats with the shins bandaged and a black long-sleeved shirt. On the arm of his shirt was the symbol of the Uchiha clan. Naruto narrowed his eyes at recognizing it who it was. In angry tone, he decided to speak, Uchiha, Sasuke. Sasuke flipped of the roof and landed in front Naruto. He sported his infamous smirk. You're as slow as ever Dobe. Naruto basically growled his next comment, what do you want Sasuke? Yumi was looking at Sasuke. Naruto had told her about Sasuke and how they fought at this place called the Valley of the End, but he never told her details of the battle. All he said was that he lost. Just came to check out if the rumors were true. Sasuke answered. Those rumors would be that you were back in town. I also heard that you beat Kakashi, Gai, Kuranai, and Asuma. Not bad Dobe, the Uchiha replied. Naruto was wearing a smirk, a lot has changed. No offense, but you're not even a match for me, Sasuke-chan. Sasuke eyes narrowed, he was pissed. Naruto knew that Barb would anger Sasuke, that's exactly what he wanted. Sasuke calmed down. Your girlfriend is very attractive. Getting her is probably the only thing you did right Dobe. Naruto was getting pissed. He knew what Sasuke was doing because he was doing the same thing. I never knew you liked girls, Sasuke-chan. I mean you always rejected your fan girls, I always thought you played for the other team. Konohamaru and Yumi could feel the tension between the two. They knew that the two were about to explode. Yumi decided to grab Naruto's arm and drag him to the hotel, Naruto-kun, let's go. Naruto nodded and decided to walk off. Sasuke spoke, getting saved by his girl, that's what I expected of you Dobe. Naruto stopped immediately. He was now officially pissed. He was not going to let this slide. He turned to face Sasuke against Yumi's protest. 
You know Sasuke, I don't like fighting with words. I'd rather use my fist. Sasuke smirked, he had gotten what he wanted, there is a training area about a mile from here. We could do a lot of talking there if you'd like. Sasuke pointed to Yumi, bring her too. I want her to see you get your ass kicked. He then puffed away to the training ground. Naruto looked Konohamaru who was next to him, protect her when we get to the training ground. Konohamaru was worried for Naruto. He knew that Sasuke was probably the strongest in the village, Naruto Nisan, I don't think you should fight Sasuke. And why shouldn't I? Naruto asked. Because he's going to be the Rokudaim, the teen stated. Naruto become even angrier after that revelation. He just kept thinking about how it was unfair that Sasuke got everything. He had to work hard to get anything and everything seems to just fall in Sasuke's lap. Sasuke was number one in school. Sasuke had the affection of the girl he once cared deeply for. Sasuke was personally trained by their Junin instructor while he was left to rot. Now it seems that Sasuke was going to live the dream, which he wished, deep down, he could live. It was just so unfair. He looked at Konohamaru, well I guess you will get to see that my power is on the level of a cage. Meet me there. Naruto puffed to training ground 7. Sasuke was standing in the middle of the clearing. Naruto and Sasuke were staring at each other intently. The power that was radiating off of them was similar to when Orochimaru and Sandime were fighting. They just stood there looking at each other for two minutes. Konohamaru had arrived with Yumi. They were a distance away. Kakashi and those who were at the barbecue shack had felt the immense power and came to check it out. They all landed next to Konohamaru. The Anbu squad came when they felt Sasuke and an unfamiliar power, they surround Naruto. Sasuke spoke to the Anbu squad, stand down. A man with a bear mask spoke, Sasuke-sama, we have a duty to take in anyone who acts against a shinobi of the leaf. I said to stand down. Don't get involved no matter what happens. He said this while looking at Naruto the whole time. The Anbu squad decided to watch the fight. Sunid and Jirai walked up next to the small group that consisted of ninjas, what is going on here? Sunid asked. Naruto Nisan is about to kick Sasuke's ass. Konohamaru replied. Hanabi, who was training with Hinata, had felt the power that came from him earlier. Her and Hinata had arrived in time to hear Konohamaru's proclamation. She decided to comment on what she thought to be a ridicule's comment. You really are a fool, monkey boy. Naruto can't beat Sasuke-sama. He's going to be the Rokudaim, no way he loses to him. Naruto looked to his left to see a lot ninjas looking at him and Sasuke. He saw Konohamaru with Yumi. She was the only person he was looking for, however he saw the one person that had broke his heart six years ago. His eyes narrowed when she came next to Sunid. The pink-haired Kaneki, known as Sakura has not changed a bit. Granted she got taller and her wardrobe now consisted of a red top, a beige skirt with black shorts under, and black knee-high sandals. Naruto just smiled. This was the perfect opportunity to beat Sasuke in front Kakashi, Sakura and everyone else. He turned back to Sasuke and was smiling. Sasuke was curious. What are you smiling at Dobe? Just smiling at how I'm going to show everyone how weak you really are, Sasuke. Sasuke's eyes narrowed at that statement. Naruto calling Sasuke-chan was one thing, but saying that he was a fag boy was over the line. He shifted into a fighting stance, then show me. With pleasure, Naruto and Sasuke formed hand seals faster than anyone could follow, and they both yelled, Katen, Ruka no Jutsu, a big dragon flew from both their mouth. Both dragons collided and cancelled each other out. No one could see what would happen after that due to the dirt blocking their vision. Sunid was about to stop their battle when Jiraiya grabbed her. Don't get involved. They have some unresolved issues that they need to settle. Just sit back and watch the show, I guarantee that we won't see a fight like this again. Sakura was looking, trying to see what was happening. Neji saw her worry, so he decided to tell her what was happening, they are engaging in a Tajutsu match, neither one is getting the upper hand. When the dust cleared everyone saw both fighters blocking the other's punches and kicks. Sasuke did a roundhouse kick that sent Naruto into a nearby tree. Everyone was looking on in amazement. Naruto rubbed his jaw, damn he's good. I didn't want to do this but I guess I have no choice. Naruto walked back the clearing where Sasuke stood in his fighting stance. That was a nice kick. But let's stop playing with each other. 
How about you take off your weights and I take off mine so we can pick up where we left off six years ago? Naruto complimented. Sasuke spoke in a mocking tone, you sure that's what you want? When I take off my weights, this fight is going to be more or less over. Just take them off already, Naruto said in bored tone. Both warriors took of their weights. Sasuke took of his wrist, ankle, and vest which were all weighted. Naruto took off the weight tag that was in his shoes. He also took off the ones that were under his wristbands as well as the one that was under his shirt and his pants. Naruto was ready. Both warriors blurred out of everyone's sight. Kakashi was stunned. Anko spoke, what the hell, where did they go? They're moving at a high speed. I can follow them but barely. They are exchanging blows. Lee committed. Out of everyone that was there only Jiraiya and Sunid saw what exactly was happening. Kakashi, Lee, and Guy were barely keeping up with the speed. Jiraiya who was looking at the fight intently smiled. He knew what had just happened. Sasuke had just got kicked in his face. Everyone, except those who could follow the fight, had saw Sasuke fly into a tree. Neji smirked, looks like the Uchiha is eating dirt. Most of the ninjas that were there couldn't believe what they had just heard. Sasuke was on par with the godaim. When the lot of ninjas and Sasuke fans saw that he was pulling himself out of the little ditch, they were surprised to say the least. Impossible. I never seen anyone who was able to lay a hit on Sasuke-sama, an Anbu guard said. Who does that guy think he is, hurting Sasuke-kun? Said a Chunin fan girl. Yumi looked at the girl, that's my Naruto-kun. This Sasuke of yours can't ever beat my Naruto. Hinata tensed up at what the girl had said. The happiness that she held regarding his return had died there and then. I should have told how him I felt when we were younger. I should have followed my heart and left with him when I saw him leave that day. I just wish that. Her thoughts were cut off by the Anbu man with the frog mask, who looked at Yumi, you mean, Naruto as in the golden fox. She looked back at Naruto who was waiting for Sasuke to pull himself together, the very same. Sasuke finally got up. His lip was bleeding. He wiped the blood away with the back of his hand. He smiled, the dobe got better. No matter, I'm still going to kick his ass. Sasuke did some hand seals. When he was finished, his right hand was holding his left wrist, the chidori was forming in his left hand. Naruto held out his right hand to form the Rasengan. I held back last time, Sasuke. This time I won't. The promise that I made with Haruno no longer applies. You better come at me with everything you got. Sakura heard Naruto had called her by her clan name instead of her given name. She was hurt, but after what she did to him she couldn't blame him. She just hoped that he and Sasuke didn't get hurt. She looked at Yumi who had earlier told a Chunin that her Naruto-kun wouldn't lose to Sasuke. She wondered if this girl was Naruto's girlfriend. Sasuke knew that Naruto was serious. He always wondered why Naruto held back and now he had his answer. It was because of Sakura. Sasuke looked at Naruto with a steely gaze, I plan to do just that. That will be it for this video if you want more comment down below, like, subscribe. And see you guys later.